this video, we're taking a conversation that we had a few modules ago about figures being congruent, and we're making it specific to triangles. So in module three, we talked about how corresponding parts of congruent figures are congruent. So we can take that and make it specific to triangles by saying that if two triangles are congruent, then the corresponding parts of the triangles are congruent. And we referred to corresponding parts of congruent figures are congruent from module three. We referred to that as CPCFC. So when we're talking about it, uh, dealing with triangles specifically, you see it often referred to as CPCTC. And it says that if all corresponding parts of two triangles are congruent, then the triangles are congruent. So this is actually the converse of this statement. And remember that the converse of a statement is just taking the if-then sentence and flipping it around. So in this explore activity that they have, they're wanting you to kind of explore that statement. And you see that the instructions here are asking you to use a straight edge and tracing paper to build two triangles having these measurements. And in the interest of time and making this video as manageably short as possible, I did that before hitting start on my video. So here's my two triangles that I built following those instructions. And in part B, they're saying, what must you do to show that the triangles are congruent? Well, back in module three, we talked about how in order for two figures to be congruent, there must exist a rigid motion that transforms one to the other. So in order to show that the triangles are congruent, we must show there is a series of transformations mapping one to the other. So it's saying arrange the two triangles as shown in the figure. So mine are kind of a little bit backwards from how they look here, but basically I could say it's kind of like that. And so you see it says in part C, move the tracing paper so that A maps to D. So I'm going to move point D to map to A. And it says name the rigid motion that was just used. Well, if you look at that, I hope that you realize that's a vector. And vectors are used in translations. So this is a translation. And you know what? I can be a little bit more specific than that. In this example, what you have in your notes, it's a translation along the vector AD. So then the triangles would look like this. So name a rigid motion that we could use that would map point B to point E. And that would be a rotation of the measure of angle B A B D E, whatever that measure may be. And it says, how can we be sure that the image of B will be E? And we know this because We know that B will map to E because we were given back here that AB is equal to DE. So here's AB and here's DE. Finally, once we get to this point, it's asking us to name a rigid motion so that I could map point C to point F, and that would be a reflection. So to show that the point C will be on point F, it's asking us to fill in these blanks. Since angle A is reflected across DE, 
I know the measure of the angle is preserved. And since I know angle A is congruent to angle D, I can conclude that the image of ray AC will lie on ray DF. But then since I also know that segment AC is congruent to segment DF, the image of point C must be F. So finally, what sequence of rigid motions maps triangle ABC onto DEF? It was a translation along the vector AD, and then a reflection, or no, sorry, a rotation of whatever the measure of angle BDE is. And then a reflection over segment AB. And before we get into determining whether triangles are congruent, we're going to take the information that we observed in that explore activity and kind of draw a conclusion from it. So what we've observed is that if two figures are congruent, then their corresponding parts are congruent. And what we observed is that if the corresponding parts are congruent, then the figures are congruent. So because the statement and its converse are both true, I am able to write a biconditional statement. A biconditional statement is a statement that can be written in the form P if and only if Q. So one way that you can think about it is that a biconditional statement goes both ways. Okay, so it's true in both directions. In example one, we're comparing the corresponding parts in order to determine whether the triangles are congruent. So they've already talked us through the whole thing, so let me talk you through it in kind of terms that might make sense. I look at angle G and I look at angle K and I notice that they have the same measure. I look at angle J, I look at angle M and I notice that they have the same measure. I look at angle L and I look at angle H and I notice that they have the same measure. The same thing is true for the segments. Looking at segment GH and segment LK, they are the same length. Segment LM and JH are the same length. And finally, KM and GJ are the same length. So that's why in part A, yes, those triangles are congruent. In part B, we're going along the same process. We're comparing information. So I know that AB, I notice that it equals ED because they both equal 12.1. So that means segment AB is congruent to segment ED. I look at segment AC and I notice that it is the same length as segment DF. They're both 7.9 centimeters, so segment AC is congruent to segment DF. However, when I look at BC, it does not equal EF. They don't have the same length. So BC is not congruent to segment EF. Therefore, the triangles are not congruent because their corresponding sides are not congruent. In this reflect example, they're introducing us to the vocabulary of a contrapositive. So remember that a conditional statement is if something, then something. The contrapositive of that statement, notice, is flipping it around. So it's kind of taking the converse of it. But then it's also taking the opposite of the if and the opposite of the then. And it's telling us that when I have a true statement, the contrapositive of that true statement will also be true. So Janelle says that you can justify part B using the contrapositive of CPCTC. Okay, so let's go step by step through this. The contrapositive of CPCTC. Well, let's look back. 
This is the statement CPCTC. If two triangles are congruent, then their corresponding parts of the triangles are congruent. So the contrapositive of that would flip this statement around and take the opposite of them. So we would be saying if corresponding parts of two triangles are not congruent, then the triangles are not congruent. And is this accurate? Yes. In this your turn four, again, it's asking us to determine whether the given triangles are congruent. So they didn't give us segment lengths, but notice what they did give us. They gave us these markings. So I know that these two sides are congruent to these two sides, so that looks good. This side is congruent to this side. And then these two angles are congruent to these two angles. And this angle is congruent to that angle. Okay, so yes, the triangles are congruent. And let's go ahead and be thorough and write a congruence statement. So we're going to say that triangle R, S, T is congruent to triangle, and it's very important that you name things in order of their corresponding parts. So I would say triangle W, V, U. And the explanation for our reasoning would be that all corresponding parts are congruent. In example five, Perhaps you notice right away, angles D and G aren't congruent, angle F and C are congruent, and angles B and E are not congruent. Okay, so these triangles are not congruent because their corresponding angles are not congruent. This paragraph may seem like something that we can glance over, um, and I'm not terribly happy with this textbook about it because it gives you a very tremendously important property here, but it doesn't make an adequately big deal about it, in my opinion. Okay, so something that you need to be aware of, maybe you want to highlight this, the triangle sum theorem says that the sum of the measures of an the angles in a triangle will add up to 180 degrees. Now, some of you may have intuitively known this. Maybe you've been exposed to it before. I think it's a big deal. It's highly important in this geometry course that you know that the three angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. And we call that property the triangle sum theorem. So in example two, we're using that triangle angle sum theorem in conjunction with kind of the examples that we saw earlier, plus some algebra to set up and solve some equations. So in part A, they're asking to find the value of the variable. Okay, so we know that angle P, kind of by default, since angle N is congruent to K and M is congruent to J, we know that angle P is going to be congruent to angle L. And we know that the three angles of a triangle have to add up to 180, so that's kind of what they're doing here. They're adding the three angles of the triangle, they're substituting in the angles that we know, and then they're finding that the measure of angle L must therefore be 80 degrees. And so they're setting up the equation, 5x plus 30 has to equal 80 degrees. And then they just solve for x. Similarly, in part b, We know that angle A, notice it's marked with one arc, it's going to be congruent to angle D. Angle B, notice is marked with three arcs, it's going to be congruent to angle E. And angle C, notice it's marked with two arcs, it's going to be congruent to angle F. So DE corresponds to AB. If you ever have difficulty identifying what corresponds to what, I'll tell you what I was just looking at. 
DE, segment DE, is formed by connecting the one arc angle to the three arc angle. So over here, I look for one arc, I look for three arcs, this is the segment connecting them, and that's AB. So I know that DE equals the length of AB. And the length of AB is 36, and so I'm substituting that in. When I subtract 20 from both sides, I get that 2y equals 16, and so y equals 8. Another example like it, or kind of like it, in this reflect problem 6, they're giving us two angles of one triangle and giving us two angles of the other triangle and asking if it's possible for the triangles to be congruent. Okay, so the third angle in triangle QRS is going to equal <clears throat> 180 minus that 18 plus 84. So I have 180 minus 102, so that's 78. Well, that 78 degree angle isn't going to be congruent to either of these, and if this angle is 76, then I know it's not congruent to this 84, so no, triangles cannot be congruent. Example 7 is very much like the example 5 on the last page. I'm trying to find the value of x here, so I need to figure out what angle E corresponds to. Angle E is going to be congruent to, and again, here's a tip. Notice that angle E is formed by two hash marks and three hash marks, so I look for two hash marks and three hash marks, and they are forming angle B. Oh my goodness, they didn't give me angle B. Well, we use the triangle angle sum theorem. So we do 180 minus... 112 plus 25, and 112 plus 25 is 137. When I subtract that from 180, that gives me 43. So I know that 43 is going to equal x plus 17, and therefore x, when I subtract 17 from both sides, is going to be 26. Pause your video to work through the last your turn, number eight.